All right, so here we are in experiment four. So this is on a topic called stereochemistry. You might also see it as stereoisomerism. So if we hear that word isomer or isomerism, that should take us back to our first experiment. And in fact, if you have model kits, this experiment, you might want to bust them out for this experiment. They are really helpful in creating um, these structures and looking at them in three dimensions. Because at one point I'm going to say like, okay, now what we're going to want to do is think about where the hydrogen or our lowest priority substituent is pointed away from us. And I'm going to say that as if it's not a big deal, as if it's easy to do. And that's actually kind of challenging uh, when you're first getting started. But if you have the model kit, it's a lot easier to physically turn the model in front of you so that a hydrogen might be pointed away from you. So if you're struggling with this experiment, get your model kit out or build some kind of a model. You could build a simple model using straws and marshmallows for all, you know, that'll work just as well as anything else. Um, so let's dive into this experiment. So an outline of what we're going to do, we're going to talk about what is a stereoisomer. We're going to talk about some definitions and applications of it. We're going to talk about the two major classes of stereoisomers. The first is what we call an enantiomer. Um, and the second is what's called a diastereomer. And the hint is, we, if we go back to experiment one, we actually already saw one case of a diastereomer, and that was when we looked at geometric isomers. So again, you know, hopefully this jogs a little bit of your memory going back to experiment one as we were looking at these compounds. So let's first start with what is a stereoisomer. So we have this kind of branched uh, graphic here that helps us break apart um, some of our understanding of isomers. The main focus that we had in experiment one was on constitutional or skeletal isomers. And those were things where we were had the same building blocks, the same number of atoms, but we could assemble them in different ways. Stereoisomers are a little bit different. Stereoisomers are compounds that differ only in their three-dimensional shape and three-dimensional orientation. Okay, it means that they're built of the same atoms and those atoms are assembled in the same order, but the only difference is the three-dimensional shape and orientation of those atoms. And so the things that you'll need to know or you'll need to practice and apply throughout this experiment, the most important one is going to be that dash and wedge structure for drawing the tetrahedral shapes. So lines being used for things that are in the plane of the drawing surface, the wedges, the thick lines, meaning it's coming towards you from the drawing surface, and the dashed lines, meaning it's pointed away from you in the drawing surface. And this is all stuff you might need to review in your textbook. This is kind of some of the fundamentals for how we draw organic molecules. But you'll really need to be comfortable with that notation in order to kind of assign some of these stereocenters we're going to be talking about. You'll also want to get comfortable with manipulating and rotating these tetrahedral shapes. Uh, so in class, you might have talked about conformations and Newman projections. Um, that's just ways of looking at these molecules and rotating them and thinking about them in three dimensions. So again, if stereoisomers differ in their three-dimensional structure and three-dimensional orientation, it's really important that you are comfortable thinking about molecules in three dimensions. Right, so before you move on, if that's something you need to review, go back and review how to draw those tetrahedral molecules and how to shape them and move them in space. So why is stereochemistry important? As it turns out, you know, more than half of the commercial drugs on the market today um, are composed of a single stereoisomer. And so that three-dimensional shape is extremely important. And one of the first cases in history where we found out why this three-dimensional shape is so important is actually the story of thalidomide. So I've drawn here on the slide two different forms of thalidomide. And we can go through and look at these different chemical structures. And we see that the only difference between these two structures is whether the nitrogen um, carbon bond here is coming out of the plane of the drawing surface or if the bond is going behind the drawing surface. So using that dash and wedge notation. That's the only difference between these two structures, S and R. And so a mixture of these two different structures for thalidomide were actually prescribed back in the 50s uh, for pregnant women. Uh, and it was a sedative. It helped with morning sickness um, was what it was prescribed for. 
And after this drug started being prescribed, uh, they found that it, there was a huge spike in the number of birth defects that were, were coming um, once the children were born. And they went back and they attributed it to this drug, thalidomide. Now, the story doesn't really stop there because it's not that thalidomide was poisonous. It's that one of the isomers of thalidomide was poisonous. And so as it turns out, the S isomer, what's shown here on the left, um, was actually the effective sedative. It had the desired properties. It was not causing any problems. The molecule on the right is the R stereoisomer, and that is what was causing severe birth defects. And we notice here that the only difference between these two is that three-dimensional shape. So why is this so important? Well, our bodies are actually what are called chiral systems, meaning they have this stereoisomer component to them. And we'll define chiral later. Um, so one of the best examples for this is actually our hands. So in the pre-lab, you're asked to think about what is the relationship between your hands? So you can see that they both you know, have five fingers and they can all bend the same way, but there's no way that our two hands are exactly the same, right? There's right and left-handed pairs of scissors because our hands can interact with these other objects differently. It turns out the rest of our bodies also have this feature. That word chiral actually comes from the word that means handedness, right? So these molecules have a relationship that is very much like our hands. And so they can interact with our body differently. Again, that big idea of chemistry is that the structure of a molecule, right, the molecular structure impacts the physical properties and reactivity of that molecule. So we want to think about, okay, every aspect of that molecular structure. So this is a new wrinkle to add into that molecular structure, which is think about the three-dimensional shape. So we're going to break this into two classes. Our first class of stereoisomers are what we call enantiomers. Now, the language here can be a little bit challenging to deal with, so you, you just want to practice a little bit with saying these. So our first class are what are we call enantiomers right, enantiomers. And our formal defin for definition for this is that an enantiomer is a non-superimposable mirror image. So that's kind of a dense definition. So non-superimposable means they cannot be made to be identical. And I advise that you go, if you need to pause this video now, go print out the PDF for the experiment and work along with us as we run through some of these things. The background for this experiment has a lot more kind of definitions and pictures that might help you visualize these relationships. You will also be seeing these topics in lecture. So some of you might have seen them already. Some of you, you might be seeing them this week. There'll be lots of practice with stereochemistry. So non-superimposable, again, just means they cannot be made identical, right? In theory, there's no way that you could line these two things up that they would look exactly the same. And a mirror image is, again, just a reflection, right? It's just a reflection. Now, an important feature is that enantiomers themselves have identical physical properties. So these compounds would have the same boiling point. They have the same polarity, right? They would have the same freezing point. All of their physical properties would be identical, um, which makes them challenging to separate. We go back to that example of thalidomide. Well, why couldn't we just separate the two stereoisomers? It's hard to separate them. Thalidomide has another challenge where actually the, the, the quote unquote bad enantiomer inside your body is converted um, back and forth, right? So both the good and bad enantiomers get scrambled essentially once they go in your body, which is not good. Um, so again, this idea of an enantiomer, they are mirror images that are not superimposable. So this picture that I've drawn, imagine that we have this molecule here on the left. When it looks in a mirror, if I reflect it across this dotted line, um, this molecule on the right is what I would get out. The H is still on a dash, right? It's looking at itself in the mirror. The BR, the bromine is still on the wedge. It's looking at itself in the mirror. This is one way that we can draw these mirror images. So these two molecules are mirror images of each other and they cannot be superimposed. I highly, highly recommend that you build this model for these two different molecules and just confirm with yourself that you cannot make these superimpose, right? You cannot make these look exactly the same in the same orientation.
So this is our definition for an enantiomer. And we wanna remember that when we are talking about an enantiomer, we are talking about a relationship between two molecules that are drawn or given, right? This describes a relationship between two molecules. So when we talk about one enantiomer, we are talking about how it relates to a second molecule. The other terminology you will hear is this idea of a chiral center. So if we look at this structure, the reason this molecule has an enantiomer is because of this carbon atom that I have this line pointed to. This carbon atom has four different substituents. That's gonna be something that's gonna clue you in on whether you have an enantiomer or not, is that you have four different substituents. It has a CH3 group, it has a H, it has a BR, and it has a CH2, CH3 group, all attached to this carbon. This is what we call a chiral center. Chiral is, again, that handedness is where that word comes from. It means this is a carbon atom that causes a differentiation between enantiomers, right? This chiral center is the reason this molecule has two enantiomers. We would describe each one of these molecules as being chiral, right? That means that we are describing this molecule as being handed, right? It has a chiral pair out there somewhere. It has an enantiomer pair out there somewhere. So chiral means it has this handedness feature. So we would say that both of these molecules on their own could be described as being chiral. They each have a chiral center they are enantiomers of each other. Now there's a lot of terminology for this experiment to kind of practice and get used to. Um, and chirality is extremely important when we think about the structure of a molecule because the way that molecules interact with our body can be heavily dictated by whether they are chiral or not. All right, so let's get into some nomenclature. So if we go back to nomenclature for, for molecules, for compounds, the idea was that a chemical name must be able to completely describe all aspects of the molecular structure. So if these enantiomers themselves are unique molecules, which they are, then we must have a systematic method to assign a name to each enantiomer. So this is where the labels R versus S come into play. So enantiomers by definition are mirror images of each other. So we only need two labels. Right, Because they're mirror images, there can only be two enantiomers of a given structure. So R comes from the word rotatory, which means it rotates to the right. That's what rotatory means. As it turns out, it, these molecules actually rotate light to the right in their initial study. S comes from the word sinister, which means to the left. So this is actually the origin for um, left-handed is where is, um, related to sinister. I didn't make it up, right? This is back in, in Latin. Um, so this is where R and S come from. So rotatory and sinister, rotatory meaning right and sinister meaning left. So where do we, how do we get these labels? How do we designate these labels? Well, nomenclature is really just a series of rules. So we have a series of rules that allow us to um, separate and label these enantiomers. So we're going to be doing the first example. So again, bust out that PDF if you haven't printed it out already. This is one of the first things that you're asked to draw and think about. So if we have this Lewis structure at the top, we know that Lewis structures can be incomplete in representing the structure of a molecule. Lewis structures do not capture the three-dimensional shape of this molecule. So if you were going to build this using your model kit and that tetrahedral shape, there's two possibilities you could make. So what we're going to start with is the one that's here on the left. We can see here that these are mirror images. If I were gonna draw that dashed line down the middle, this would be a direct reflection right across that mirror plane. We're gonna focus with this one on the left in determining how we assign these labels of R and S. So our first step is when we draw this molecule, we're gonna do something that's called assigning priority. Now this is using an arbitrary set of rules, right? These rules have no basis in the physical world. This is a, something that chemists have designed in order to describe the difference between enantiomers. 
Now, priority is done by atomic number. So we look at our chiral center, which is this carbon in the center here. We can see that it's attached to four different things, an iodine, a chloride, a bromide, and a hydrogen. And we are going to assign those priorities based upon their atomic number. Higher atomic number is higher priority. So you want to make sure you have a periodic table handy when you're working on these. We're going to talk about a couple tiebreakers in a few minutes. But if we have two substituents that have the same atomic number, then you look at what those substituents are attached to. So we might have to continue to look further and further down the chain. The other tiebreaker, which we'll show an example of here in a few minutes, is the double bonds count as if they are bound to two of the same atom. So we'll see that in a few. Thankfully, for this first example, we can just use atomic number, which makes it a little bit simpler to assign priority. So when we look at our periodic table, iodine has the highest atomic number, so it has the highest priority. So we assign it the priority of one. Chloride and bromide and hydrogen, we can similarly look across the periodic table. Bromine is further down on the periodic table than chlorine, has a higher atomic number. So bromine gets a priority of two. Chlorine gets a priority of three. And hydrogen has our lowest priority. Right, it's atomic number one, so it is almost always going to be our lowest priority substituent. So whenever you see a hydrogen, normally that's the easiest one to assign as being your lowest priority. Right, so that's a hint that you can think of moving forward. I'll say this before we, we move get too far ahead of ourselves. If you look online, there's a bunch of different ways of people analyzing R and S. People have their own little tips and tricks, and, and whatever works for you is fine. Um, but understand that the way that I'm going to approach it is the way that I'm digging in, or sticking to in this PowerPoint. Um, so if you find another method out there that works, that's great. As long as you can continuously get to R and S, um, and they are the correct assignments, that, that's totally fine if you find something that's different. All right, so we have these priorities. So what do we do with them now? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to rotate the molecule so that our lowest priority substituent, whatever is number four, is pointed away from us, right? So I'm gonna rotate this molecule just a little bit so that that hydrogen atom that's my lowest priority number four is pointed directly away from us. And that means that my iodine, my chlorine, and my bromine are all kind of pointed towards me. If you've done a lot of practice with Newman projections in lecture, you could think of this as saying you're looking at a Newman projection from carbon to your lowest priority substituent, whatever that one might be. And the nice thing is that once we've assigned these priorities, we don't have to think of these as atoms anymore. All we care about are those numbers one, two, three, and four. So this structure on the right is just saying, okay, I no longer care about the fact that it's iodide, chloride, bromide, and hydrogen. All I need are those numbers, right? So the first step was assign priority. The second step is what I'm calling the flattening, right? We're making sure that that number four is pointed away from us. And then we're left with these numbers one, two, and three. So what's our next step once we've flattened this? We wanna look at the orientation of just one, two, and three. So we wanna think, do these numbers go in a clockwise rotation or a counterclockwise rotation? So here I can see that I go from one to two, two to three, and then three back to one. This rotation, the ordering of these numbers is clockwise. R comes from a clockwise orientation of these numbers. If they were counterclockwise, if we went from one to two to three, then it would be the S in antimer. So this is how we can de um, designate whether something is the R or the S in antimer. Once we have these priorities, we flatten them out. We look and see, does it go from one to two to three in a clockwise fashion or a counterclockwise fashion? And that will tell us, that will clue us in, right, on which in antimer we have. So here we see that it's clockwise. That means that this is the R in antimer. So we can zoom way back to that initial slide and we could say that this molecule that we had drawn on the left-hand side is the R enantiomer. So if we look at this pair, right, we wanna make sure that we can go through and do the same exact process on this molecule on the right. If these are enantiomers, they will have different labels, all right? That's really important that we kind of see as we're going through this practice. If these are enantiomers, they will have different labels. 
by definition, when you do a mirror reflection on a center, R's change to S's, S's change to R's, right? So that means that when we go through and assign this structure on the right, we absolutely should get an S. But what I want you to do is pause the video if you need to, go back and rewind if you need to, take this structure that's on the right-hand side and try to assign the labels. Try to assign whether this is R or S, knowing that the answer is that it should be S. So at the end of the day, hopefully you get that this is S, right, for this structure. But go ahead and go through that step. Assign priority based on atomic number, then flatten it, right, so you get that shape, and then evaluate whether the numbers go clockwise or counterclockwise. Right, so that's what we're gonna do with enantiomers. So I told you we're gonna talk a little bit about some complex cases. So these are in the background of the experiment as well. So we're gonna first talk about this molecule here on the left. So how did we assign our priorities here? So we're first evaluating an oxygen versus a hydrogen versus two different carbon atoms when we look at this shape. So the oxygen has our highest priority because it has the highest atomic number. The hydrogen, however, has our lowest priority because it has the lowest atomic number. So we have right out of the gate assigned our top priority one and our lowest priority four. But these are both carbons, so they were tied for second place. So we have to be able to distinguish between these two. So then we look at what these atoms are attached to. So this carbon here is attached to another carbon atom. This carbon here is only attached to hydrogens. So when we're trying to de determine what I think of as a tiebreaker, we're saying, well, I have another carbon atom versus just hydrogens. Carbon atom out here has a higher atomic number than the hydrogens here. Therefore, this side on our carbon gets the higher priority compared to this side on our atom. So that's how we get the two and the three here for assigning our priorities. This just takes some practice, so take some time as you're working through these. On this molecule over here, what we're changing is now we're looking at a double bond. And so when we're thinking about how we assign priorities, here we have the, these two atoms are both carbons again. The one on the right has a double bond to a carbon. So we treat this as if it's bound to two other carbon atoms, whereas over here on the left, it's only bound to one. And so these are tricky ways of assigning priority. Um, it gets kind of challenging, especially as molecules get more complicated to determine the priorities, which you need in order to determine R and S. So again, read through the textbook. There's lots of practice problems that are out there for these, and it just takes some time. So try not to get frustrated, build some models, think about these things in three dimensions when you're assigning R and S. So that's our first class of stereoisomers, which was enantiomers. Our second class is what we call diastereomers. Now, diastereomers have a similar definition. So diastereomers are non-superimposable, so again, these are unique molecules. We're again describing a relationship between molecules. However, they are not mirror images, right? So they have the same patterns in connectivity, the same functional groups. However, they are not mirror images of each other. So our first version of this is gonna come from when we have multiple chiral centers in a molecule. So these two structures that we have drawn have two different chiral centers, two different carbons that bear four substituents that are different, right? So when we have more than one chiral center, we can have diastereomers. We can see here that these are not the same molecule, and yet they're also not mirror images of each other. So part of the experiment is going to be going through and assigning R and S to these. Now, the second version of a diastereomer is something we've already seen. These are geometric isomers, are actually diastereomers. So between these two different formations that have the double bond, we saw this in experiment one, we can see that these are not superimposable, right? You cannot make them line up and look exactly the same in space, but they are also not mirror images, right? These are not reflections of each other. So by definition, these are diastereomers. So let's look at some examples. So this is part of the experiment data for the experiment. This can be a little bit tricky to draw, so I wanted to give you some help out of the gate uh, to try to figure these out.
So structure A is the first molecule that you are building for this section of the experiment. It's called diastereomer modeling. Um, and I believe it's, you know, the, the second page of results or something like that. So structure A is where we start. And what you want to do first is you draw out and you build a mirror image for structure A. So that means that the relationship here is that these are enantiomers. A and B are enantiomers of each other. Then as we go down to structure C, what the, the prompt is having us do, and this is, can be a little bit tricky to, to decipher, is that it actually has you switch only one of the chiral centers. So we can see that in A, our chlorine is on a wedge. Down here in C, our chlorine is still on a wedge. However, I've switched the dash and the wedge for my other chiral center. So these are structures that you will need to draw in your lab manual. Um, and I'm just trying to give you some help here on how to get these things started. Structure D is one that you are going to have to build and decipher um, using the lab manual as well. So if we're looking here at these relationships, right, we have mirror images at the top. So these are mirror images of each other. Therefore, these are, drum roll, drum roll, brrr, Enantiomers, right? So these are enantiomers of each other on the top. However, if we look at the relationship between A and C, these are not mirror images of each other, but they are stereoisomers. Therefore, A and C are diastereomers of each other. Structure D, sorry, structure D here is the mirror image of C. Right, so structure D is the mirror image of C. So spend some time to try to build that model, to draw out that structure. And the real challenging part that I'm gonna task you with right now is you have to assign each one of these chiral centers as being either R or S on all four of these compounds, all right? So that's part of this experiment. You need to build these models, you need to draw them out and assign each center as R or S. So that means that there's two designations for each and every structure as R or S. So there's a lot of work to do on this one set of problems before you start to describe that relationship. So let's review a little bit of our terminology here. So a chiral molecule is a molecule that has one chiral center or at least one chiral center. Chiral just means handed. So if we have a chiral center, we could say our molecule has this handedness property. Our first class of stereoisomer was what we called an enantiomer. And so this refers to a pair of molecules that are non-superimposable and mirror images of each other. This takes some practice to see. So again, build some models, hold them in front of you and try to see how they look like mirror images and yet you cannot make them overlap in space. Diastereomers refer to these pairs of molecules that are both not superimposable and yet are also not mirror images. So again, the reason that this is nice in a video is you can rewind, you can go back and look at some of these slides and kind of work through some of these problems. This is another tough experiment, largely because this concept is very challenging. Drawing out, thinking about molecules in three dimensions is very, very hard. So spend some time with the model kit this week getting used to this, right? There's a lot of value in understanding this three-dimensional shape. As we saw with the example of thalidomide and a number of other pharmaceutical compounds, the difference between enantiomers can be the difference between life and death. It can be the difference between something that is a medicine and something that is a poison. So this has some real far reaching impacts out there in the world in terms of things that are used as pesticides, things that are used as you know fertilizers or growth agents, things that are used as drugs, things we experience all the time. So spend some time trying to build these models, spend some time trying to dig in um, to this lab and understand the difference between these three-dimensional shapes.